<clears throat> Hello and welcome our sixth talk to our sixth talk in the 2020 NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these seminars is to showcase NOAA's leadership in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. First, I want to acknowledge my partners who worked to make this seminar series happen. Hernan Garcia with NESDIS, National Center of Environmental Information, or NCEI. Sandra Clark with the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation. Tracy Gill with the NOS, National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. And I am Katie Rowley with uh, NOAA OER's NOAA Central Library. Before we start, here are some seminar logistics. Please type your questions and comments into the Q&A chat box at any time, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the seminar. If you are having a techn technical issue, try logging off and back on. You can also type any technical issues into the chat box, and we will address them. We are also recording the seminar. The recording and a PDF of the slides will be made made available in a few days at a link to be included in the chat box. A follow-up email will also be sent. If for some reason the internet connection is lost, please just log back in using the same login. Today's seminar is titled Evolving Challenges in Fishery Science and How We Are Tackling Them by Dr. Sisko Werner. Dr. Sisko Werner is Director of Scientific Programs and Chief Science Advisor of NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. In this capacity, he leads NOAA's fisheries efforts to provide the science needed to support sustainable fisheries and ecosystems to continue our nation's progress in ending overfishing, rebuilding fish populations, saving critical species, and preserving vital habitats. As director, Cisco supervises the planning, development, and management of a multidisciplinary scientific enterprise of basic and applied research. He oversees NOAA's six regional fisheries science centers and the Office of Science and Technology. Cisco's research has focused on the study of the oceanic environment through numerical models of ocean circulation and marine ecosystems. He has studied the effects of physical forcing on low, lower trophic, trophic levels and the subsequent effect on the structure, function, and abundance of commercially and ecologically important species. And he has contributed to the development and implementation of ocean forecasting systems. Cisco's past appointments include the director of NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center, director and professor of Rutgers University's Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences, professor and chairman of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's Department of Marine Sciences, and chair of the GLOBAC, Global Ecosystem Dynamics Program. Cisco was originally from Maracaibo, Venezuela, and he received a bachelor's of science in mathematics and a PhD in oceanography, both from the University of Washington. Thank you, Cisco, for your leadership and for presenting at the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series today. And take it away. Thank you, Katie, um, uh, Tracy, and, and, and also Hernan, um, uh, for the opportunity to, um, to be a part of this series and to share with you a little bit about the challenges that we're facing in fisheries sciences and, and how we're taking them on or, or how we're tackling them. I'm going to start. Um, with three to four slides in the spirit of a, of a preface, if you will, to, to give you a big picture um, of, of what I want to message, um, and then I'll delve in, into some of the details. So this, this collage here, if you look at the top level, um, or the top strip, um, you know, it, it kind of shows the work that we do in fisheries, where we work uh, to ensure sustainable commercial and recreational fisheries, uh, the recovery and health of protected species, populations, all of which is supported by a healthy ecosystem. Um, as an agency um, and through our collective efforts, it's fair to say that we have been quite successful at, at, at these efforts. Underlying all of this in the bottom strip, um, you can see uh, uh, there are env environmental changes that, that we need to consider. Um, in this case, you know, this heat map, if you will, of the ocean uh, during the, you know, 2000. Uh, 14, 15, 16, warming of the North Pacific and the El Nino. Uh, we also have uh, uh, observed uh, changes at the base of the food web through changes in, in lower trophic uh, uh, systems. And we're also witnessing uh, changes in, in the use of our seascape, uh, in this case shown by uh, the, the, the appearance or the construction of offshore wind farms uh, and aquaculture. So there's a, there's a changing environment out there that we have to work with as well. 
And in the middle strip, you see I'm going to be talking about how we need to approach you know, the, the work that we, that we need to continue to do, plus also the, the, the changes that, that we're facing. And so we are, we're going to have to take on new ways of, of, of measuring, of observing, uh, new ways of, of estimating and assessing what we see, um, and then also new ways of, of, of communicating the advice. At a big picture in terms of what we do, um, NOAA does uh, nationally, um, you know, as, 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 as a mission agency, um, you know, we're driven by, uh, by legislative mandates, um, and these include, you know, Magnuson-Stevens, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, a recent executive order on promoting American seafood competitiveness and, and economic growth. And all of this leads to, um, you know, how we, uh, you know, communicate high quality or have to communicate high quality and timely applied scientific information for conservation and management and decision making. And, this includes a, a host of things, uh, you know, providing fishery, fisheries information and statistics, stock assessments, economic and social analysis, and others. And if you look at um, the, the map I have in the middle, it, it shows the EEZs of the areas uh, in which we work uh, within, within NOAA fisheries, um, and, and also uh, some international components, you know, for example, down in, in the Antarctic, we have a, an Arctic research program and other international efforts uh, that, that, that we uh, that, that we need to uh, fulfill. <clears throat> but this is the fisheries issues and the fishery sciences challenges that we have also have a global uh, impact and a global relevance. And so these, the, the, the pictures that I show next here, um, the, the, the picture on the, on the left is, is perhaps one that, that you've seen before. It, 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 uh, it, it shows over time um, uh, the increase of, of um, uh, Fish production, um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, marine capture in, in sort of the light blue um, or inland capture, as well as since perhaps the uh, the, the late 80s and so uh, an increase in, in aquaculture, which is both um, inland aquaculture as well as marine aquaculture. The point in this case is that you know as, as we look at at the world population, you know, approaching perhaps 9 billion by by the year 2040. Where, where agriculture already uh, uses about 40% of the Earth's land uh, surface and over 70% of the water used going towards aquaculture, I mean agriculture, the increased utilization of the ocean as a human provider seems inevitable. We're going to have this is going to be a, a component of, of how we address, um, you know, the, sea, the, the the food production. Now that picture on the left is, is sort of a global picture of, of of fisheries production, but in terms of what it means uh, at the level of, of individual nations and their dependence on, on protein is a picture on the left. Uh, and what you can see is um, this is broken down by, by, by region, by countries, African countries in sort of the light blue, uh, the countries in the Americas sort of in the orange, Asian countries in the green. And, and you see that depending on where you are, what region of the world you are, what country of the world you're, you're from, your reliance on seafood for um, uh, uh, for for protein and, and and other nutrients is 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 heightened. So if you look at, for example, I'll just pick one that's easy to see. If you look at the Maldives, in the top right, um, you know their protein intake of, of, of seafood is is over you know is nearly 100 uh, grams per capita per day. And if in terms of the y-axis, it says that you know the fish and seafood. Is about 70% of of that that they consume. So they the certain countries, you know, the you know in Oceania and other places, you know, really depend on seafood as, as a source for nutrients, whereas others um, less so. And 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 if you look at again the, uh, the 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 yellow dots and the orange dots, which is which is the Americas, um, you know, we see that 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 dependence is lessened. The point here is that while there is a increasing dependence. On, on, on the health of the oceans and the seafood that, that, we, that, we, that, that is generated from, from the oceans, it also depends on where you're from. It's, it's also very regional in terms of, um, of that dependence. This next slide um, is, is, is a couple of papers, and uh, both of which are in Science Magazine in 2005 and 2018, on, on the fact that, you know, if we think about what I just said in terms of the, the complexities of um, you know, understanding environmental change, understanding how we bring new approaches, new technologies, how do we think about 
uh, the importance of the, of the seafood supply, um, et cetera. The, the way that we're going to have to work to address a lot of these problems is, is, is through um, you know, these collaborative teams. And, and, and the quote from the paper here is that the size of the collaborative teams is increasing, turning the scientific enterprise into a densely interconnected network. And if you look at those three panels on the top, you know, it kind of shows the evolution of the science. It's not just that our questions are evolving, but also how our science is evolving. You look at, at, at how things used to look like in the early days, you know, where you had perhaps individual thinkers. It doesn't mean they were totally in isolation, but people like Darwin and Galileo and Einstein and so on, or separate dots, if you will. Then, you know, the evolution into, into biochemistry and so on. Then, then the second picture shows that there's more interconnected interconnectedness between the sciences, between biology, chemistry. And then the third um, uh, panel here is, is from the human genome experiment, where, you know, in order to take that on, it was not just biochemistry, it was not just genetics, but you had to bring in, uh, you know, ethicists, you had to bring in legal issues, you had to bring bioinformatics, you had to bring a whole host of approaches that, um, that, that, that were required to take on this next challenge. And so the follow-on statement, and I think one that, that in some way closes my preface here before I go into details, is that the contemporary science that we take on is, is a dynamical system of undertakings uh, driven by complex interactions among social structures, knowledge representations, and the natural world. And I think that we have, we have I think, all witnessed and experienced this growth in terms of how, in this evolution, in terms of how our sciences and the approach to doing our sciences evolved. But it's also a message that, that, that I think is, is one that we need to think through as we, as we think about not just the, you know, the discrete challenges that, that our sciences might, 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 might have, but also the network and the approaches that, that we need to bring in order to, to address these. And so now comes the outline. So that was the big picture of, of, of the challenges that we have in front of us um, and, and how we might go forward. The outline, uh, I'm going to touch maybe about, uh, on four perhaps points. Um, one is, you know, really quickly looking back, taking stock in, in terms of have we made progress and where are we. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, rates of change, um, secular, I mean, more, more gradual as well as rapid rates of change. Um, and then, you know, perhaps the, uh, the requirement as a result of these uh, for different ways of, of sampling, of counting, if you will, and making decisions, and also the evolving technologies and models and, and how we integrate this to, 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 again, address our challenges, and then close with some, um, uh, you know, final remarks and, and conclusions. So taking a, a look back, this is just one slide that I want to talk about here, um, and it's focused on work that we've done in, in NOAA. So this is focused on, on, on our efforts here. And if you think about some notable, notable advances, and I kind of broke it up into three columns. Um, the, the leftmost column talks about particularly um, you know, fisheries. Um, and uh, these are data from 2018. By the way, all the references, I try to reference everything here in those, in those URLs that, you know, um, you know should, should, you, should you need to download the, or wish to download the files, they'll be live and you can dig deeper into them. But anyway, um, you know, we have made an enormous amount of progress in terms of the stocks that we manage, in terms of their status, whether they're an overfished stock or, they're, or whether they're undergoing overfishing. And, and we're 80% or above um, in, in these stocks in terms of being sort of on the, on the, on the, on the correct side of, of what we're trying to do, of, of diminishing overfishing and, and reducing the number of overfished stocks. In the middle panel, uh, or the middle of the panel, you know, I talk about recovering uh, threatened and endangered species. And again, just a few numbers here in terms of the numbers of domestic, foreign, and transnational um, uh, stocks that we, that we deal with in, in protected species. And these could be marine mammals or or it could be salmon and, and others. And the recovery plans, uh, you know, are quite complicated, requiring restoring habitat, uh, offsetting, um, you know, adverse actions that might happen, enhancing population numbers. And again, these are over the past decade or so, you know, it, you know very significant progress have happened. And the third panel is something relatively more recent, uh, talking about what we refer to as species in the spotlight which are focuses on species that uh, in some cases are so low that they need to be bred in captivity. And we're trying to, in some ways, uh, you know, change the slope of the curve to make them beginning to come back uh, on, on what otherwise might, might, might appear to be, uh, you know, a route to extinction. And I'm not going to dwell on these too much other than to say that 
that these have been successful efforts that, again, as an agency, um, you know, we have been able to to take on and and um, and, and and again make positive 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 progress on them. So the question then is, if if things are quote going relatively well, should we stay the course? Um, and maybe a different way to ask the question is, can we stay the course? And so this brings me to the point about the oceans are changing, and and the fact that they're changing rapidly. So, you know, what what the conditions that perhaps we worked on and under which you know the, these positive statements that I just made earlier happened, you know, occurred under a, a, a set of conditions that perhaps um, you know we're not witnessing anymore, or at least they're changing more rapidly than than we thought. These pictures are perhaps familiar to you. I mean, uh, you know, the one on the top left uh, is 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 just a statement about uh, changing temperatures over time, uh, and in particular, you know, this is uh, you know looking at at uh, how the temperature increases again, um, you know, are, are, are on the order, you know, depending on where you look at, you know, whether it's the Gulf of Maine or others, it's, 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 it's gone up, you know, perhaps a degree or two, depending on where you are. And I think I just lost my slides. Did I lose the presentation? Coming back. Sorry about that. Oh, wrong one. Coming back. Sorry about that. Okay, Cisco. Okay. Um, so we know that there's sort of global increases in temperature. We know that uh, on the, the the picture in the uh, in the in the top uh, uh, I'm sorry in the um, in the top right is is changes in the biogeochemistry, say in, in pH or CO2, PCO2, and so on. Um, again, uh, it, you know, it, with with sort of uh, changes that that, uh, that again we're familiar with, you know, uh, acidification, changes in acidification, and, and other biogeochemical signals. And the picture in the bottom is is uh, a, a more recent, um, uh, deeper understanding of these marine heat waves. Um, and the point here is that, you know, not everything is just a. Is, it can just be categorized in terms of a global change. I mean, these are the, the heat waves. Whether they're in the North Pacific or off Australia or in the Mediterranean, these are local events that that happen. They have different durations, and that require perhaps a little bit, um, uh, you know, more careful look and 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 scrutiny at a regional level in terms of what's happening. So I'm going to go on into a couple of examples here about you know why these things are are so unique and 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 how they um, uh, you know how they they impact what we do. Um, you know, and, and, and as I said earlier, you know, the changes that we're seeing are not just, you know, significant changes, but the rapid changes that, that we're seeing is, is, is also pretty unique. In this case, um, uh, these are uh, the, a, a distribution of ice, as you can see in, that, in the red circle, the, the white represents uh, ice in April of 2013, 15 or 18 um, in the Bering Sea. Uh, and you can see that they're they're over over a very short period of time over the five years that that, that these three pictures show uh, there's basically a disappearance of of the ice in the region, um, and that has resulted in in shifts. Uh, you know, it has resulted in 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 in, um, in the uh, it has an impression on on the water column, if you will. Um, and and if you look at the top three uh, slides, uh, they are. Hang on, I lost my. My, um, I lost, I lost a little arrow. I don't know. Oh, there it is. Okay, the arrow is back. Um, the uh, the 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 purple areas uh, show the colder temperatures. Um, you know, when there's ice, you can see the the the, the purple areas. Uh, uh, you know, more pronounced as the ice is lost. The, uh, the 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 area of, of of this cold water referred to as a cold pool decreases, and in turn, what that does is if you, and then you look at the distribution of of in this case Pacific cod, um, as this cold pool retreats, the Pacific cod then migrates into areas that it wasn't before, and this very rapid migration, um, in, you know, from over a period of, of of five years or so, from from regions that were further offshore and further south to further Onshore and further north is, is is something pretty remarkable in terms of how we sample the impact on the fishery, et cetera. There's also longer term changes that happen, as I said, more secular changes, more more slower. 
And that's the picture on the right. In this case, it's a black sea bass. Um, you know, we're <clears throat> rather than, you know, a period of, of five to 10 years in, in terms of the shift of the Pacific cod, in this case, we're talking about maybe around 40 years, you know, from the 1970s to, to now, we see either a, a, an expansion or, or a northward migration of, of the black sea bass. And these are, again, this is one example of, of how, um, you know, the, the, the distribution of species begins to see, begins, you know, is, is something that, that requires that we understand why and, and predict where they are and when they are where they are. Another aspect, in addition to the shift in, in the species geographically, is also changes in communities locally. Um, this is um, not in the North Pacific, but it's actually off California. Um, and uh, this is sometime in the 2014-15 uh, time period when, when the, there were, the North Pacific experienced a, a very rapid warming and sustained warming. Um, and what you see here is on the, on the left, you see three slides of a single survey and the, the captures that three different toes showed. You know, it, it, a, a survey, you know, at the north end of, of, the, of the survey showed basically rockfish. Um, if you if you went further south, it was basically all these jellies, uh, pyrosomes. If you went even further south, at the southern extreme of the survey, it was it was these these pelagic red crabs. This diversity, you know, that's, that's really manifest in, in 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 how these three different surveys show such dramatic differences in, in what's caught in the nets is also shown in, in the uh, in the in the sample tray here on 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 the left. I'm sorry, on the right. Which again, um, you know, as as you as the folks who, who conducted the survey collected the different species that, that were there, noticed a, a, a diversity of, of of species that that really hadn't been seen before, at least certainly not in the last 30 or, or so years. And again, it's not just magnitude of the change and the magnitude of diversity, but also the rate at which we we see things happening. These are these are things that 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 again we we hadn't seen before that we're trying to integrate in terms of how we think about them. And finally, in terms of an example here, I don't want to go too much into too many examples, is, is changes in food web structure. This is, again, um, in the North Pacific. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what you see here is a time series uh, of the late 90s um, uh, to, to now, uh, roughly. And um, uh, these are what, what we are, are anomalies in, in, in copepods. Copepods are these uh, little animals on the, on, the, on the right side. And, and you have these three larger kinds of copepods, and those are referred to those are northern species. These are not different life stages; these are different kinds of copepods. So these you have three different kinds of copepods, which are bigger. I'm not sure if you can if you can see in, in the slide, but you know you can see the uh, the the, uh, the lipid sac. So they are actually filled with you know with, with fat, which in turn you know perhaps injects energy into the food web. One way to think about it. And you have, on the bottom, you have these three southern ones, which are much smaller, that don't have the same lipid content. And, and what was noticed was a change in, 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 in that same time period, that, that warming period that happened in the North Pacific, from, from uh, a case, you know, to, to, uh, to, to northern copepods showing this very strong negative anomaly, meaning there were many, many fewer, uh, relative to the Southern copepod anomaly, which is over here, where you now have this this increase in 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 the lipid poor, energy poor, if you will, uh, copepods from the south, and that of course impacts again. You can think about how that base of the food web changes the energetics of of what happens further up in the water column. So those are snapshots of you know changes in distribution, changes in composition, changes in food web, food web structure. All of this is you know is is not just a discrete um, you know, uh, uh, bits of information that we look at, but but actually, uh, here's a very nice paper um, by Mike Litzow and and others um, that began to say, well, we see all of these relationships changing. The the shuffling in all the relationships is actually leading to us not being able to explain, understand, uh, you know, processes or relations between signals and species that we manage the ways that we used to do before. So what I'm showing here is something called the North Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And you know the, the two little uh, globes there just say that this oscillation, which again, decadal happens roughly on, on sort of a 10-year time scale, 
you know, it can change from, uh, you know, from one set of conditions to another, but it oscillates back and forth. And that oscillation, that specific decadal oscillation, in turn, was used to understand a whole sequence of things that would allow us to say, well, what happens to the salmon, a particular salmon? There's many different kinds of salmon, but without getting into the details, there was a relationship um, in between the 60s and the 80s in, in this slide over here, in the middle slide or the middle panel here, that said, hey, there was, we could actually look at the PDO and, and maybe the stand of the PDO, whether it was in the red phase or the blue phase or whatever you want to call it, and say, I can explain perhaps what's happening to, to the salmon. That relationship is broken down. So now if you look at that, at that rightmost panel, uh, as it says down here, the relation between the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and the salmon no longer is there. Why? Well, there's, again, I, the three examples that I, 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 I used before illustrate the fact that there's many components to understanding how everything is connected, leading to the overall um, um, you know, picture that, that we use to not just be able to, to connect the dots, but actually be able to explain and perhaps even uh, forecast you know, how, how, what conditions might happen. So it's not just that things are changing, but our ability to explain things is also changing. And so if you look at this, and I've talked in this case about Pacific decadal oscillations, there's also the North Pacific gyre oscillation and others. Focusing on the word oscillation, I'm going to jump to the next slide. It says that we're also in a position of, of evolving from stationarity and I'll explain that in a second, what that is to non-stationarity. So if you look at the three green uh, plots here, uh, you know, uh, it's sort of on the right side of, of, the, of the plot, things do oscillate. They go up and down. But they're, they're within, say, a, a, an envelope. And so the stationary is like, OK, there's specific decadal oscillations. They go up and down, and we can, we can understand that. You know, that's, the, the fact that we can look at things that vary, you know, assuming they, they, let's say, fall within some kind of a predictable, understandable Gaussian distribution, if you will, in a simplest way, well, that, that, that still allows us to make um, decisions, provide advice, and so on. What's happening is that we're seeing perhaps a trend or tendency in some place towards non-stationarity. And, and non-stationarity um, is, is, is the time when time series are not just oscillating back and forth, but their actual mean and variance is also changing. And that becomes something a lot harder to predict. So while we have you know, the up and down in the green here, well, now there is a trend associated with it. Or the changes in amplitude happen, uh, you know, the, with the, you know as, as illustrated here, a frequency. And this is illustrated or discussed very nicely in the paper um, resource management, but having to do with water, not with fisheries, in, in a paper by Millie et al. in 2008, um, I think also in Science Magazine. So now we're, again, we're, there's very fundamental things in terms of what, what are happening, how things are connected, and how things are changing. And so therefore, our ability to manage, to predict, and, and, and provide advice. And then I'm going to also touch on another thing, which, which, which I talked about earlier, which is, which is, which is changes that are happening um, because there's different uses, uh, multiple sector uses of the ocean that we didn't have before, at least not in, in the quantity and effort that we had before. So we have offshore wind farms, um, uh, shown here on the left. On the right, we have aquaculture facilities, again, in areas where perhaps some of our fisheries, perhaps where some of our protected species are, and so on. And these um, you know, the, the fact that now the ocean is going to be used um, differently than it, than it was adds, a, again, a, a layer of, of considerations that we have to include in terms of how do we collaborate across sectors to improve science management and operations? How do we develop a, a science framework to assess the cumulative impacts of, 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 these, of, of, of these undertakings and optimize benefits among, you know, a set of diverse and valid goals. And, and the picture here in the middle is, is, is one from the North Sea. Um, and what you, I'm not sure if you can tell, but, but uh, this is a wind farm in the North Sea. And, and, and if you can see these little lines here, these are sediment plumes that follow, you know, during a certain part of the tide in the North Sea, uh, you know, associated with individual wind towers. I mean, so there is, there is an effect, of course, in this case, in terms of sediment 
resuspension and so on that's associated with these. So just an example of how other aspects come into play when, when we look at, um, at things that are happening in the, in the coastal ocean. Excuse so just to recap a few points here. Yes. Hi, um, I just want to let somebody, we do have the phone open and somebody is not muting their, their, uh, their sound. It's like they're typing and we're hearing it. And I was hoping they could make sure to turn down, mute their phones by hitting star six. So if you're on the phone, please hit star six. Thank you. Go ahead, Cisco. Okay. Um, so recapping a few points, um, I've, I've, shown, I've argued that the changes in the oceans and their ecosystems are unprecedented. And they could be unprecedented in terms of the change that we're seeing, but certainly many times in the rates of change that we're seeing. You know, this gives us an opportunity to, to you know, the fact that we've had a chance in the past five or six years to see these things, to either say, well, now we've had a peek into what might be a new baseline or a new future in terms of, 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 of the changes that we're observing. Um, and um, the other part is that we just need to be ready and better prepared to deal with surprises. I mean, these are things that, that I think happen that, that we, um, you know, can't, can't ignore anymore. So let me just jump to then Okay, so we know that's happening, so what do we do about it? Well, um, a number of things come to mind. Um, we need to sample differently. Things move. There's more things um, uh, than, than there used to be, perhaps, again, in some places. Uh, you know, again, I, I, not everything is happening in the same place at the same time. So we need to be mindful of, of what, when, and where we sample differently. Um, we need to provide assessments differently, and perhaps we need to... Um, also uh, provide, uh, uh, make decisions differently. So the management decisions are different. Um, in particular, uh, you know, focusing on some work that, that's happened uh, within, within fisheries um, in, over the past five years or so, uh, we've developed a climate science strategy, next generation uh, stock assessment plans. We've developed an ecosystem-based fishery management plan. Um, and, and also the, uh, the, the uh, an ecosystem-based uh, roadmap. So we have a, a, a sense of, of you know, I, I'll just point to these documents in terms of where past thought had led us, you know, to, to these formulations of things that we need to consider. And for example, uh, some of the recommendations are we need to focus more on process research. Why? Well, because the connections that I mentioned earlier are different. All of a sudden, you know, if the PDO doesn't work anymore the way we did, well, why not? We need to understand those processes. What are those new processes? We need to consider holistic approaches. You know, the, 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 you know we know now that things are connected um, differently. Uh, we also know that, that it's important to understand, uh, a, 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 take an ecosystem view of, 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 our, of our system. And I think, you know, it also, they also address that we need to, um, be more explicit in the inclusion of uncertainty. Uh, there are there are things that we just don't know yet, um, and and how do we how do we include that is something that that we need to that we need to keep in mind. And with regard to that, um, you know, and, and and bringing in back the uh, concept of um, of non-stationarity, um, you know, if in the past, and again, this is probably simplifying. If in the past, you know, we had some a simpler way of defining how things happened. Um, the future, you know, one can argue is going to bring more uncertainties to it for, for, for the reasons uh, that, that I explained. And we'll, how does that translate into what we do or what we think? Well, we need to be, we need to have more robust management strategies to reduce risks. We might want to take precautionary approaches. We might want to plan for extremes. Uh, again, no one single answer will work in one place. I mean, these are things that other, that, that depending on where you are, you might want to think about you know, how to use forecasts to help plan and target fishing, or do you want to adapt timing of the fishing season or, you know, impose more flexible regulations? Really, the message is that we need to start managing for variability and not stability. And so that's perhaps one of the key messages that, 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 that we, are, we are embracing and we are understanding and is contained in, 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 in the thoughts and, and documents that, that I referred to before. And also that these strategies perhaps need to, you know, dampen or, or perhaps buffer a little bit the highs and lows, and the impacts that that uh, that they might have on livelihoods, um, and 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 economies that depend on 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 the fisheries on those resources. 
The next thing that emerges is the, the creation of a next generation data acquisition plan. The next four slides or so I'm going to be focusing on, on data. And um, the last time in fisheries we did something called a data acquisition plan was, was about 20 years ago. And I would argue it was quite successful. It led to, you know, the white ships that are pointed out here on, on the right, you know, and it led to, you know, the ways that we, that we did surveys. And in this case, for example, and, you know, I'm just showing some here um, off of um, Alaska, Bering Sea. Um, but, you know, it, you know, and those, that, those approaches and that plan led to what I said earlier when we took stock in terms of how are we doing, you know, in terms of uh, diminishing the, the, the overfish stocks or overfishing that's undergoing. So again, that was a valid approach. But now the questions have changed. As I said, you know, the, the distributions of, of organisms have shifted, perhaps the vital rates have shifted, so we need to measure different things. Um, the consideration of ecosystem uh, uh, components, the changes in fleets, um, which includes, you know, partnering with industry, as well as a whole host of new technologies and analytical capabilities. So this is, this requires, uh, I think, a, 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 an evolution in terms of how we plan our, how we're going to plan the, our data collection enterprise, if you will, for, for the next decade or so. And we can take advantage of these huge, you know, advances in observing and computational capabilities. The, the picture on the on the top left um, is is from John Delaney, um, University of Washington. Boy, it must be must be like 2005 or early 2000s or something like this. This was basically, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say science fiction, but it was, you know, it was 15 years ago, and we thought, you know, boy, it's gonna it's gonna take forever to get there, and we're there now. I mean, the things that that were put there in terms of uh, the use of sensors to measure, to use molecular signals, uh, you know, to, to the telemetry aspects of things, um, you know, then to use, you know, passive acoustics for whale vocalizations, um, the unmanned systems that can measure all kinds of things that we weren't able to do before, uh, the computational capabilities that, that bring all of this and, and allow this ocean of data, if you will, to then be analyzed with artificial intelligence and machine learning things are all things that are here now. They are, they are things that we're working on. There are things that are within reach. And, and there are examples that, that we are um, actually um, uh, following up on right now. This is a, a, a short note to say that uh, just this year, uh, we, we, we completed uh, four uh, strategies on unmanned systems, artificial intelligence, omics, um, so molecular approaches, and cloud computing, and they're they're now published. And there's a fifth one on citizen science that that's happening, uh, uh, you know, in parallel, but but hasn't quite. Uh, it started a, a little bit a little bit later, so it's not quite completed. And these approaches are ones that um, you know are led by Admiral Gallaudet um, and a whole team of, of folks that say, how are we going to move forward with these approaches? in this next ocean that, that we have to, um, uh, you know, work with and, and deal with. And this is just one slide of an example of, are we doing it? Is it still science fiction or are we actually doing it? And the answer is that we're doing it. The pictures here on the left are all perhaps the way we used to do things. So we'd have ships with acoustics. We'd have, you know, uh, you know the, the, the uh, you know, where would, you know, the, the, the transects of where we do the surveys. Here's the acoustic signals. Um, you know, we would collect the fish, and you know that resulted in in, a, in, in, in our ability to assess you know the, the population numbers and health and distribution. This year, or I'm sorry, this is in 2009. We 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 complemented that with with a, a fleet of of unmanned systems. In this case, sail drones. Um, basically, redid some of the sur same survey transects that, that were done in, in um, you know, using the normal white ships as we refer to them. But we also added measurements now with just collecting water and, and beginning to look at, at the, at the eDNA, the environmental DNA that, that is left over from, say, in this case, hake, uh, sloughing off or, or you, know, uh, you know, leaving behind some uh, uh, genetic material that we could look at. So this is the beginning of of perhaps a, a initially a complementary view of of, of, of of this particular stock using, I'll say, conventional approaches and new approaches, but hopefully we can evolve this to, 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 to take advantage of some of the new capabilities that we have. 
And so this then goes back to thinking about this evolving approach of this larger universe of data that we have. And, and uh, there's a quote by Edwards Deming that, that you all may have seen before. He says, you know, without data, you're, you're just another person with an opinion. And, and you know, this, this you know, it's, it's, it's a very simple statement, but I, but I think it does encapsulate probably what most of us understand is that we need to take advantage of all these different data sources to actually be able to complete the picture of, a, as I said, a very rapidly and deeply changing system that, that we're looking at. Um, you know, I've already talked about unmanned systems. Um, there's the aerial systems uh, that, that are also available on, uh, you know, that, 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 we, that, we, that we use. There's electronic monitoring um, uh, on, on fishing vessels that, that allow us to, to provide us perhaps a, a fishery dependent um, uh, signal of, 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 or a component of data. Um, there's underwater optical instruments that, 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 that also provide, you know, uh, data in places that we weren't able to go before because they were untrollable and we couldn't drop nets because of the harm it would cause to the, to the, to the system or to the corals or, what, or whatnot. So there is this, this, there's this universe of data that, 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 is, that is becoming available that we need to take advantage of. And I'll just say that... Um, I'll try to summarize, you know, the, this transition in terms of a hypothesis-driven science that perhaps we've been working on towards now, perhaps some data-driven science. That doesn't mean one substituting for another, but there is a an evolution, uh, uh, perhaps a complementary aspect to it. It used to be that, you know, whatever we were measuring, and that's represented by these different color boxes, um, you know, would 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 take weeks to plan out, you know, what we did, you know, uh, careful calibration, ground truthing, and a hypothesis of, okay, I think this is what I'm going to go out there to measure. We now have, as I said, you know, the the, the universe of data that's coming in, um, you know, that that you have data that that perhaps had calibrated differently um, with limited uh, ground truth, and and. And, and, and the question is, how do you make sense of all of this data coming into, 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 you know, in, into your ability to, 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 uh, to provide uh, you know, information and analysis of the system that you're looking at? So I don't want to go too deeply into this thing, but it's just something to think about in terms of how, not just how we measure things, but how we think about all the data that comes in and how do we take advantage of all the data um, um, is, is something to also consider as well. I'm going to end with... A couple of points on evolving approaches uh, concerning modeling and integration, and I'll try to go uh, quickly on these. The question, for example, I'll start off with, could we have predicted that warming in the North Pacific? Is that something that, that we could have done? And, and there's uh, you know, very nice studies uh, that have looked at uh, retrospectively uh, in hindcast mode, you know, can we, could we have actually done it uh, you know, if we had initialized the model certain ways or in certain times? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends on when you initialize it, what state the ocean was in, and so on. And this picture here on the, on the right is, is just shows, you know, the, sort of a challenge of, um, of how good your forecasts are depending on whether you're looking at weather forecasts, whether you're looking at forecasts in weeks to months, or months to seasonal and longer. And what you see here is that we kind of have picked a hard problem. Um, you know, while weather forecasts, you know, in some places are excellent, you know, you have the initial conditions of the system and, and you let it go and you, you, you know, your next four or five day forecasts are, are really, really good. When you start going longer, it becomes harder. Um, it becomes harder for a number of reasons, but, but the, the, the point is that, that, that we picked probably one of the harder problems that we want to do. How do we forecast things that are on the months to seasons to years time scale? And that's a challenge that we have. This is one of the challenges. And the longer we go, and this is, I'll try to simplify this, this picture. This is from uh, colleagues at, at GFDL. The longer we go, the more components of the Earth system you have to include. So focusing on the picture here on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, this is, um, a global picture of primary production uh, forecasts or projections. The redder the area, the better the forecast. So the redder the area means that you know we can predict chlorophyll you know up to three months out or, or longer in some cases. And so you see there's parts of the ocean that are redder than others. In some places it works 
you know, some of these forecasts work and others don't. And in this case, I'm just going to pick two boxes, the North Atlantic. Again, if you, without getting into detail, the North Atlantic is generally redder than the North Pacific. We do better at the North Atlantic than the North Pacific. Well, why is that? And it could be that one of the answers is that the North Pacific depends on properly capturing um, dust from the Asian continent. So iron deposition on longer timescales from the Asian continent is important to understand the chlorophyll primary production in, in the North Pacific. So all of a sudden you said, I want to understand what's happening in the ocean, but you have to include other parts of the Earth system. And again, the message here is that the longer time scales, the ones that we might be interested in, are not just a matter of looking at the ocean or the atmosphere, but actually at more components of, of the Earth system. And that is captured in, in you know, these multiple time scales and multiple things that we look at are captured in this, in this image that, you know, it's, it, it, it has time on the, X, on the X axis and space on the Y. It's, similar to what's, what's referred to as a Stommel diagram, where, where you say, you know, on, on weeks, you know, there's hurricanes and storms and things like that. On longer time scales, there's global warming or these decadal oscillations. How does that relate to our goal of managing, you know, our ocean resources? And again, you can see that on, on, on short time scales and, and, and small time scales, there might be industry operations. Then you get to longer time scales and bigger areas, catch limits. And eventually, you begin to look at um, resilience and, and sustainability. What I want to say here is this, this, this area here in the middle, which is sort of that months to few years time scale, is the one that we need to work on in terms of the impacts on species and ecosystems. And, and we, are, we have, uh, uh, together between uh, uh, fisheries and OAR, so oceanic and atmospheric research, um, uh, we have develop what we refer to as a climate and fisheries initiative. It builds on, on a number of things. One, we need to answer some questions that we just talked about. Uh, and second, we have the capabilities, you know, with the, with the modeling capabilities and, and observing capabilities to begin to actually say, hey, we might now have, you know, uh, we might be able to aim to have robust climate and ocean related forecasts, predictions and projections uh, to guide management and adaptation strategies. This is something that we've all been working on, or many of us have been working on for a long time, but we're at a point in time when perhaps we have to, and secondly, we can uh, you know, plant this flag, if you will, in terms of something to do. So this is something just that we just agreed to, and it's something that um, you know, I'm looking forward to in the next two to five years, um, seeing how we develop this. So now I'm gonna conclude, finally. Um, you know, I talked a lot about, um, you know, individual things, you know, changes in biogeochemistry, changes in temperature, how that might affect shifting distributions, how that might affect change in productivity. Uh, if you go further out, I said, well, we need to change the way we measure. We need to understand new processes. We need to evaluate, you know, how, you know, what kind of risks we're willing to take in the assessments and, and so on. And so this outer part then goes into how does this all translate into management, which I started off by saying is something we also have to do. And, you know, a couple more, one, one or two more slides and, and we're done here. But the thing is that as we think about the future, we really, you know, as we plan for future scenarios, we know it. And I didn't say what it is because it is whatever you want to fill in is going to happen. There's a lot of things that are happening depending on where you are and, and we need to be ready for them. And that requires, or one way is, you know, through structured scenario planning, management strategy evaluations as an example, it's a formal approach of, of planning for different what if scenarios. We need to communicate the risk and the trade-offs more clearly. And there needs to be this engagement between scientists, managers, academia, and affected communities. It's, it's going back to that third or fourth slide that I said how science now really is a much more integrated endeavor than, than, than it was in the past. And it really does require bringing in all of these inputs and, and thoughts. So my final slide is, well, OK, so everything is changing rapidly. And, and, and well, so what do we need to know? And how will we get there? Uh, somewhat facetiously, but somewhat uh, not. I mean, what do we need to know? Everything. Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of things that are changing, and 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 we 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 are kind of like defining a new ocean and a new way that things are behaving. And how will we get there? Um, 
as I said, you know, there's there's new approaches in, 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 in how we use data, data collection and the analyses, new approaches in modeling, and new approaches in co-production of advice, um, you know, including, you know, science managers, communities and stakeholders and getting back again all the way to the, to the citizen, citizen science uh, component of our approach. And so I went long, but I'm, I'm going to stop here. This is my last slide. And, and I do want to thank those, you know, who, who listened today. It was, um, you know, it was a pleasure to be able to, to speak to you. But I also wanted to thank, you know, a lot of people that contributed ideas to, 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 to this presentation. I, I try to reference the, the slides uh, in my slides, you know, where I, where I borrow the ideas, but there's, there's, this is this really is a, an agency-wide effort. Um, it's something that, that that touches just about any any group that, that you can think of, and a lot of the ideas and, and thoughts and 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 outlooks here are due due in, in 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 large part to my conversations with my colleagues. So with that, I'll close and um, and thank you again for for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Cisco. That was just a wonderful presentation. Lots of great images and lots of big ideas. So we will now take your questions and comments in the Q&A pod. And Lindsay Kratz, Senior Advisor for NOAA Fisheries Science, will moderate those questions for us. Thanks for joining us today, Lindsay. And please begin. Hi, thanks, Tracy. Uh, Cisco, we have a lot of really great questions coming in for you. So the first one is from Stephen. And his question is, is the decrease in Bering Sea ice believed to be a temporary or permanent change? Um, it, great question. Um, it, it, you know, we look at it every year. Um, uh, you know, some, it, it, you know, I'm sure it'll, it'll, uh, there'll be times when, when it'll come back, um, and and, um, and and that is is part of the uncertainty that I talked about earlier in terms of planning. How we do, how we plan surveys and so on. We have to be very adaptive to 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 these conditions that that presently are not necessarily just one way. So 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 could the ice come back? Yeah, um, you know I think that there will be years when when the ice will come back um, and and we will you know that'll have the implications of of how we sample and 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 where we sample. So it, it it's not a one way uh, uh, direction uh, at this point. No. Great. The second question we have is from Terrence. What effect do changing biotic interactions, if any, have on the distribution shift of cod and pollock? Can the species distribution models shifts be explained solely by physical conditions? Uh, great question. Uh, the example I brought in of, of um, uh, you know the change the, at the base of the food web uh, perhaps uh, is, is is part of the answer, right? It, it's um, I talked about the zooplankton, um, you know, the zooplankton species that shifted from lipid rich to lipid poor. So the the shift the shifts in geography have to be associated, you know, if, if a population yeah. is going to could, going to succeed or be successful, um, is that they're going to have to find either the right substrate or the right the right food. Um, you know, to be able to, to maintain that population. So, in fact, um, you know, one of the things that we observed, I think it was in 2017 or 18, um, was that uh, some of the changes in the population abundance of, of, of Pacific cod actually had to do with the change in the, in, the, in the zooplankton composition. So it wasn't just a shift in space, but it was also a shift in the underlying food web. So it's, it's both. You have to look at, and that's part of why we need to, sample in a much more holistic way and not just where things are but what is where things are are, are there the right uh, is it is the right feeding environment there is the right habitat there etc for for those populations to succeed um, uh, once they've shifted great and i think that goes really well into arturo's question about as the fishery stocks continue to shift distribution northward does the U.S. Um, consider to negotiate with Canada in keeping um, ha or to keep having access to that fishery? So, how are we dealing with the the, the fish stocks moving northward towards Canada? Yeah, the the transboundary issue is um, is, is a very important one. Um, you know, the, the jurisdictional aspects and, and sort of that that's that other part of the network of the science, right? It's not just it's not just about you know the science question, but it's also 
uh, you know, there's there's a, the, the legal jurisdictional and the rights uh, question. Uh, there's a number of stocks that we that that we that we look at um, uh, jointly with other other nations. Uh, you know, Albacore off of the U.S. Canada West Coast is is one that is you know worked on jointly by by the um, by the two countries. Um, uh, Mexico and the U.S. have have several stocks like that. Uh, off the East Coast, there's actually uh, a, a standing group that looks at, um, at transboundary species between Canada and, and the U.S. So the answer is that this this does bring in an additional layer of needing to be able to predict where where the species might be, and then also deciding how to apportion um, you know the catches uh, that 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 are transboundary. So it, it's 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 Part of that next challenge that we have in terms of how do we manage a system not just in response to the, the biology or the physics, but also in, in terms of the transboundary rights issues. So it's 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 part of what's on the table in terms of when when we meet internationally, um, um, uh, you know, with our partners. Great. Well, Stephen asked, is there the classification as stationarity or non-stationary dependent on time scale? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so uh, you know, you you know, something might be non-stationary, but depending on on on, on the uh, the answer is yes. That the short answer is it, it 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 there is there is an element there of how broad your window is. Some people would say. Stationarity has never existed. We just have probably looked at stationarity over. We have looked at non-stationary processes over a short period of time or a short window. Um, but those are the kinds of things that, you know, uh, perhaps it's not just the, the the time over which it happens. In other words, how rapidly things go from one to another might then make that non-stationary process more apparent or more uh, acute than 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 if that non-stationary occurred over over slower time scales. But yes, absolutely. Good question. So Leslie asked, what is the biggest factor for the change in fish location? Salinity, temperature, turbidity, or food? And then she was asking, can you provide any resources on where someone could find what factors impact species? For example, cod or salmon. Yeah, temperature is a is a big one. It's not the only one, um, of course, you know. But but uh, you know, uh, temperature is one where where we have uh, looked at for a long time in terms of how how species change or distributions associated with that. Um, uh, in terms of, of of resources, there's a number of resources in in, in the slides that, that that I that I that I had or that I showed. Um, uh, and again, that's part of um, that climate and fisheries initiative uh, that, that I talked about. Understanding those changes and, and, the, and the mechanisms um, or, or the processes, the cascade of processes that, that, that happens when, when, say, temperature changes that, that might result in shifts or not. Um, you know, a, a, a joke here, you know, my approach has always been, um, uh, you know, initially at least, you know, was looking at the physical side of, of, of the of, of, of the environmental changes, and uh, you know, focusing on temperature too much. You know, somebody pointed out to me, uh, Cisco. You know, fish don't eat temperature; uh, they actually eat something else. And so, uh, I don't want to say temperature is the only thing that 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 affects it, but it is perhaps one of the one of the triggers that does affect a cascade of of, of changes that that result in, in 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 let's say changes in the feeding environment, which in turn causes um, you know a, a subsequent change of shifts and and such. And that's part of what that paper that, that, that I talked about, the, being able to explain the PDO and the salmon occurrence. It's a very nice paper that talks about other processes that, and other factors that come in, um, you know, associated with, with certain changes that, that it turns out you really do need to understand the composite of factors that comes into place and not just focus on one. Great. Well, now we're going to go a little bit more big picture for the next few. Rick asks, can you elaborate on how partnerships with industry might change to address the NIMPS data needs beyond what's already being done, for example, with SailDrome? Yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, the partnerships with industry, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the electronic monitoring, you know, if we are able to, to 
sample more continuously and in different detail on, on, on the vessels, we would be able to get information perhaps more quantitatively and, 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 and more quickly, um, you know, to be able to make um, uh, some of the assessments uh, that we need to make. And that's, that's a partnership that, that is, um, um, you know, quite, quite healthy and, and, and progressing well. I, I, you know, another example, I mean, you mentioned sail drone. That's a partnership with, with I don't want, I, I want to go beyond the partnership with just sail drone as, as the company, right, uh, that produces the, the unmanned systems. But another partnership that emerges is, let's say we have, like this year, uh, because we weren't able to deploy all the vessels that we would have liked in, in the Bering Sea because of, uh, of COVID, we have been able to deploy uh, sail drones. Um, but, uh, you know, the sail drones, while they are very good at telling us, providing an acoustic signal and the distribution of where, you know, the acoustic signals are and, and so therefore where the fish might be, we still need to, you know, um, have some information on the biology, you know, size composition, age composition, etc. So you can imagine another partnership with industry would be if we have the sail drones or other um, autonomous vehicles out there that provide us part of the signal is to say, well, you know, if we partnered with an industry vessel that happened to be in the area, say, can you please, you know, do a net sample for us in this area that then we would then be able to analyze, you know, for that biological signals that I mentioned, you know, like size, age, condition, and things like that. So there's a number of areas where partnership with, with industry um, is perhaps a natural way of thinking, um, you know, how we move forward. So you just talked about partnerships with industry. Now we're going to step out a little bit further. Hernan would like to know, how does NIMPS plan to contribute to the upcoming UN decade of ocean science with public and model with skilled data? Um, great question. Uh, so there were, as you know, the, the UN decade of the ocean, um, uh, part of the process was uh, establishing these regional um, working uh, meetings, uh, you know, they were focusing on North Pacific, focusing on North Atlantic, Caribbean, um, et cetera, different regions of the world. And what we were able to do with it through our participation in, 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 um, uh, in, in these meetings is to say, well, you know, how can some of these approaches that we brought in, let's say, uh, implementation of methods that we and others are developing, like, like eDNA, for example, I just bring one up, which is a relatively simple and now perhaps even uh, affordable approach to begin to characterize, um, say, the health of the ecosystem in ways that we weren't able to do before. Um, and can we bring that uh, to sort of a global table through the UN Decade of the Ocean? I think the UN Decade of the Ocean offers a unique opportunity. It, it's going to start, I think, in 2021, um, and I believe that the summary of these regional meetings um, uh, will take place uh, this calendar year or next, and 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 perhaps we can then bring together, you know, ideas, approaches, whether it's whether it's um, approaches that are that are that are uh, collection of data or to analysis or to assessments. I think we do have an ability to. Um, to partner uh, with with the, with 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 uh, with other nations through through the UN decade, so I'm actually quite optimistic in terms of um, of, of where we might go after this next round of, of summary and, and 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 understanding of how we can um, uh, again uh, share the same problems that I talked about earlier that are not just ours. These are global problems that we're facing. Um, you know, with our, with our, with, 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 with the broader UN, um, under the broader UN umbrella. I'm sorry it went long, but it's just, it's, it's, it's an exciting opportunity, um, and it's one where I, I think there is a very good um, uh, a chance of, 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 you know, all of us beginning to bring a, a common approach and understanding to a number of the problems that we face. I agree, Sister. Yeah, that UN decade of the ocean is pretty exciting. Um, the next two questions are, are, are very similar in nature, and that sort of brings us back to fisheries, or NIMS in particular. Uh, so Ray was asking, what technology do we wish we had now to help us tackle some of these challenges? 
And then Jason had a little spin on it. If there was one thing about NIMS you could change to get it or us ready for all these changes, we'll see in the next five to ten years, what would it be? So what would you, what, what change do we need to get ready for and what technology can help us get there? Well, I think the changes are, are, are the fact that we need to be perhaps more nimble in, in trying to, um, uh, you know, really understand and, and evolve our approaches with, with the changes that we're seeing. So, uh, you know, I, I think if we, if we say, well, we know that, that things are, are, are changing, can we, how do we, how do we begin to affect some of the necessary evolutions in, 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 in stock assessments in including aspects of non-stationarity versus stationarity and the kind of advice that we do in a way that, uh, you know, perhaps does it in parallel with, 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 with the, um, with the um, approaches that we have today. So I think, um, you know, that, that, that ability to bring some of these technologies um, to play more quickly is something I wish we could do, which, which, which requires, of course, um, um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot more effort because we might have to do two things, um, you know, at once in terms of uh, continuing to do what we do because, uh, because we still need to provide some set of consistent answers with, with past approaches, but, but at the same time, how do we take into account new technologies? How do we take into account uh, the changing aspects of the environment and so on? So it's, 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 it's the ability to, to, to evolve with the conditions that we're seeing evolving. And I probably wasn't too clear on that, but I'm trying to answer two questions at once because I think the question that Jason asked was what is the one thing that, that what was the second question? If there was one thing about NIMS you could change to get us ready for all these changes, we'll see in the next five to 10 years, what would it be? Um, I think they're related questions. I think the, uh, the, the and, and, I, and, and it's not necessarily a, 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 a fundamental change. I think it's, it's more the, the rate at which that we, at the rate at which we can implement um, uh, some of the things that I talked about that I think, you know, again, were laid out in, you know, carefully laid out in, 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 in the plans that I talked about, whether they're stock assessment improvement plans or EBFM, you know, ecosystem-based roadmaps and so on. I think we have a good sense of what we need to change and what we need to do. I think that the, 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 the rate factor is, is, is one perhaps we need to ratchet up a little bit in terms of how quickly we implement these, these ideas that, that, that have been laid out um, um, you know, for us in some way. So for something that's on everyone's mind these days is obviously the pandemic and COVID-19. And we did get a couple of questions on how the pandemic um, is relating to our fisheries data. So I'm gonna sort of um, combine some questions that we got from folks and maybe be a bit more broad about how is NOAA adjusting to COVID-19 and our um, maybe perhaps reduced abilities to collect data? Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a, a, a you know obviously a hugely important and timely question. Um, uh, this year, um, you know, uh, as we understand um, how uh, you know how, how we make sure that 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 um, uh, we remain safe and 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 and, and healthy in, in 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 view of everything that's happening, we've we've had to. Um, uh, we haven't been able to 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 go out uh, and conduct the surveys that we normally would have conducted. We this year, between um, our own NOAA fishery surveys, charter surveys, surveys in partnership with academic partners, states, and we've had to cancel probably over 50 um, uh, surveys, and and um, there might be more more on the horizon. I think um, you know perhaps if anything, this this um, raises the the, uh, the importance of the development of unmanned systems, autonomous systems, um, uh, the ability to conduct the analysis and, and you know, using this broad um, universe of data that I talked about, you know, the data-driven science that perhaps we, we have to think about the data that we can collect, you know, 
from wherever we can collect it, of course, you know, with some understanding of the quality and, 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 and of the data that, that we have. But I think one of the things that we do need to accelerate is, is, is our ability to keep collecting data even in, in, in the face of, you know, the, the difficult situation that we're in right now. So when I had some of those uh, slides in there with the unmanned systems and the autonomous systems and the moorings, I think that's something that, um, uh, you know, we're going to probably have to have to think about how we invest in those strategically so that hopefully, hopefully it'll never happen again, you know, but if something, if, if we're faced again with not being able to go out to sea, uh, we can still provide the data that's needed to continue managing our resources and, and being able to, make, to, 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 to fish sustainably. But I think that's one of the things that we learned um, uh, is, is not being able to, to collect the data um, has been very painful for all of us. Um, you know, next year, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be hard when, when, when we, we're going to try to make assessments and, and estimates uh, with missing data. Um, but it also says, you know, that, that we probably need to start thinking differently in terms of, of how, how to mitigate um, uh, should future, uh, uh, you know, should future challenges similar to this one happen again. Well, now I'll switch to a question that's maybe a little bit more hopeful in nature. Uh, Beth was wondering, in order to meet the challenges that you just talked about in your presentation, what are the skills that are needed in NIMPS that it currently doesn't have much of? How does the training of students need to change in fishery departments? Um, it, I, I mentioned the uh, the four uh, strategies uh, that are out. There's a fifth one that uh, that is not out yet, the citizen science one. But there's four strategies: the omics, unmanned systems, um, cloud computing, and um, artificial intelligence. Each one of those uh, each one of those strategies talks about the importance of increasing workforce proficiency. Uh, and that's not just um, I think bringing people in from from the outside or or ensuring that 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 you know that that, that um, uh, you know the right training is off, is offered at, at the, say the graduate school level to put it that way. I think that that we're going to have to do a lot of thinking in in in, in terms of increasing the internal workforce proficiency that we have. Uh, and each one of these strategies, if you look at them, um, has that as one of the um, uh, goals and objectives, either goal or objective of 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 the strategy. So I think this is a um, uh, again. Um, Unfortunately, heightened by 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 the situation that we find ourselves in, but uh, the the training that we that that we need to do internally as well as in the future as we bring in, um, you know, say uh, new 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 members uh, into NOAA is something that we're going to have to pay attention to very very closely. So it's both. It's 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 as we as we hopefully able to grow our workforce, but also internally. Um, we need to to strengthen the workforce proficiency of the workforce that we have right now. So we're almost out of time, and you have a lot of great questions coming in, Cisco. So I'm going to try to get through as many as I can before we wrap. But Mike is asking, to support community research efforts, how are the collected data made available? Are there barriers or challenges in data availability and access? Um, uh, great question. So uh, the answer is the data should should all be available. Um, you know, we do know that there is a uh, an executive order of public access to research results (PAR). There's some data uh, that is proprietary. Um, uh, you know, fisheries data that that um, you know can be obtained in certain ways. Uh, uh, but you know, again, there's there's proprietary aspects that we need to respect. Um, but the data is is uh, is is something that um, you know definitely is, is something that that we are committed to making available. Um, you know it's it's uh, you know we're working on on data modernization. Um, you know cloud cloud aspects, big data aspects, and if we're going to be part of part of that evolution in our science that I talked about, you know, that more integrated view of things, the data that has to be there. So um, except for again some proprietary data, uh, you know, all of our data should should and needs to be available um, uh, publicly. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. There were so many great ones, but Cisco, I'm going to leave this one to you, this sort of 
brings it home and, and unites the agency as um, Fisheries goes. Sean is asking, as an agency, we often compete regionally for resources, but many of these issues require collective wisdom across NIMPS. What mechanisms can enhance this more national global collaboration? Um, hmm. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, so I, I think the question is, uh, you know, that we're working within the agency well, but how do we ensure that that cooperation works more broadly? Is that roughly the question? I think so. I think it, just asking how how can we at NOAA work across the board more rather than just being siloed in our particular region? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think that we're we're not siloed. I mean, I'd like to think that, um, and, and I'm sure that in some cases that might 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 be the case. But you know, we do collaborate with so many other agencies, whether it's you know ONR or BOEM or National Science Foundation or U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, et cetera, that, you know, the problems are so complex and they do overlap and no one agency can, you know, can can answer the question by by itself. And so the collaboration, I think, is is one um, is a natural collaboration in the sense that we're asking the same questions. Um, and perhaps it's a collaboration of necessity that, that we can't answer the questions, um, you know, on, on our own, and we need to partner up. And, and ultimately, you know, the question on the UN decade is another one in terms of this is a global conversation and it's a global approach that, that, that we're taking on because these are global issues. So I think that, um, you know, taking a regional siloed approach is, um, is, 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 is not going to lead to good answers. And I think that I think all of us naturally are open and collaborative and, and invite, you know, a broader a, 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 a broader look and a broader participation in, in finding solutions. So not saying it's totally perfect, but I would say that in general that that, that collaboration does exist, um, whether it's with other agencies, with other state agencies, federal and, and internationally. So could it be better? I, you know, I, I, I probably, there's always room for improvement, but I think overall, um, we, you know, the fact that we share so many of the challenges and we all want to find those solutions um, does bring us together. And actually, uh, it, it, um, I'll just add, you know, I think that we're, like I said, we're running out of time. I think uh, um, some of us have to, some folks have had to move on and so on. But I, if the questions are be saved or if people want to submit questions um, via email um, I have my email on on the on the presentation um, I'd be happy over over the next few weeks to try to get back to all of them <clears throat> and maybe we can post a, a sort of a summary um, of, of questions and and, and thoughts um, that we can share with the broader group so I'd, I'd be happy I'd, I'd be happy to continue the conversation I appreciate all the questions it um, it, it, it uh, one always learns more from the questions, perhaps, than one what says. So I thank you so much for the very thoughtful and insightful questions from everybody. Thank you. Okay. Well, Cisco, thank you for a really thought-provoking presentation and question and discussion, too. Uh, Lindsay, thanks for moderating the question. Folks online, thanks for joining us. Um, and we will try and get those questions answered, and we'll try and post a PDF of those on the website along with the... Um, the slide PDF and the recording. So um, thanks again, Cisco and Lindsay. And just to let you know, our next seminar in the NOAA Environmental Leadership Series will be on Tuesday, July 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And it's titled Collecting and Providing an Operational Integrated Digital Understanding of Our Earth Environment to Meet NOAA and the World's Needs by Dr. Stephen Voltz, NOAA's Assistant Administrator for Satellite and Information Services. So thanks, everybody. Cisco, any last words? Uh, no, just to uh, uh, reiterate my thanks. Um, apologies if I went a little bit too long. It's just an exciting subject. And um, um, I, you know, please do please send me any advice, uh, thoughts um, uh, that you might have. I, I, I certainly look forward to hearing from you. And, and thank you again for the opportunity. Sure. When you have 700 people online, you do not go too far. You've got to answer some of the questions. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Bye-bye.